how many people will choose not to get the vaccine. And it's not, even though we at We Got Us, of course, believe in the power of the vaccine, the safety of the vaccine, I'm vaccinated, all of those things, we can understand why someone may not want to get the vaccine. Hi, welcome to Adult Hope Penny Podcast. I'm Annalise. I'm Brittany. And I'm Kimmy. We're a podcast where college students, recent graduates, or anyone else who's also figuring out that being an adult isn't as simple as it's made out to be. Join us each episode as we share how we're navigating our careers, postgrad lives, and the whole adulting experience. As more adults become eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine, we wanted to have a conversation about the vaccine. So joining us today are two members of the We Got Us Empowerment Project, a grassroots collective of Black community members, healthcare professionals, students, and allies seeking to educate the Black community members to come to their own decisions about getting the vaccine. So we are very excited to have Kareem King, who serves as Community Engagement Director for We Got Us. He's currently a second year student at Harvard studying history of science and global health. Joining him is Caleb Gordon, and he is a co-project director at We Got Us and is a second year student studying anthropology and neuroscience also at Harvard College. So thank you both for joining us. On our episodes, we usually ask our guests where they are in their adulthood journey. So if you'd like to share where you are and how you got involved um, with We Got Us and other things you're involved on on campus, as well as how you actually got started um, engaging with the organization. Yeah, I can start. Um, So like you said, my name is Caleb um, and I study at Harvard. Um, And I guess in terms of my adulting, journey. I just turned 20 um, and all of the existential dread that comes with <laughs> being a real adult now. Um, and you know, I'm a sophomore at Harvard. Uh, so I guess in my in my work uh, journey, that's where I am. Um, I'm originally from Orlando, um, but now I live right outside of Los Angeles. Um, and I guess um, joining We Got Us was really kind of tied to turning 20. Um, mm-hmm. And that like, you know, I was thinking I'm 20 years old now. I have to think about what I want to do after college, what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I kind of always thought I wanted to be a doctor, but I wasn't really sure. Uh, so I was like, this would be a great opportunity to kind of engage with a different side of medicine um, that I always kind of thought of. Like, you know, because mm-hmm. you hear like, you go to the doctor, you you know, things like that. Um, so I was like, oh, but docs can get involved in community projects. We can be community advocates, health advocates. Um, so I thought it'd be a really cool opportunity to not only do incredible work like in relating to the pandemic, but also get some incredible experience regarding grassroots activism and grassroots health activism. Um, mm. So that's kind of why I chose to join. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and I can go next. So my name is Kareem King, as you mentioned, and I've also just turned 20 this year. So mm. where I am in my current journey with that is basically just figuring it out, you know, um, where I want to go in life and kind of just understanding like where um, my interests really lie. So I'm also a pre-med student and I've been like thinking about that for a while, kind of just like where I want to mm-hmm. go in the space of medicine. And a lot of what I've been thinking about is um, thinking about health policy and kind of like how um, those things outside of the hospital kind of influence people's health and like mm-hmm. health outcomes. So that's mm-hmm. kind of why I joined We Got Us as well, thinking about how we can advocate for black health outside of the hospital and kind of address those like social determinants of health that really like influence health healthcare um, even before people get to the hospital setting or can see like a medical provider. Mm. Wow. Brittany's also pre-med or was graduated <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yes I sympathize with your struggles <laughs> of the pre-med lifestyle <laughs> mm-hmm. that's great though that both of you like have some sort of I guess like medical background as far as your studies are concerned but also you're interested in other things like I at first when I heard about this organization expected it to be you know, people that are like very well accomplished in the medical field that are like already doctors or nurses. So it's cool to see that this organization has different people involved in it. So it seems in a way like more relatable. And I'm sure that's also what the community members might feel. Yeah, absolutely. We felt really passionately that, you know, the work relating to COVID and the pandemic, it can't necessarily come from this place of like people who've had all these years of education and have all this mm-hmm. knowledge and are trying mm-hmm. to share that with the community members who don't necessarily have those same things. So we thought a really mm-hmm. great place mm-hmm. for advocacy to come from would be from, from us students that are interested in health and have some expertise, but also can relate and don't necessarily understand all the jargon that comes out um, of these people who have all this learning. Mm-hmm. 
Hmm. I feel like it also makes us like more able to kind of explain this to people because you know a lot of what we've seen mm-hmm. is that like if you've been in the medical field for like a while then you kind of like, have this understanding that kind of might not be as relatable to the people who are kind of just learning about this or don't really have that kind of expertise yeah mm-hmm. for sure I know like when the vaccine started rolling out I was super unsure about like all the details I had to ask one mm-hmm. of my other friends who's in medical school right now and then he like really broke it down but it was it, just like hearing him explain it to me versus like the news or like (laughs) some professional it it was nice to like have someone speak at the same level that I do so I could really understand what was happening I think there's also this privilege that comes with being young you know we can go out into the community we don't face those same risks from COVID that maybe an older person would have or a person with more comorbidities would have and on campus we're getting access to regular testing um so we thought using that privilege using those things that we're equipped with. Um, we can go out into the community and do that door knocking and all of that work mm. that's so impactful, maybe safer than other people in the community could. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, so we would love to hear more about how did we get us, we got us begin and when did you two decide to join the organization and why did you decide to join it? Yeah, so I can go first. So we got us started, I want to say four months ago now. And um, Mm -hmm. we basically like joined uh, like late January. And basically it started like coming from this place of like, um, just like kind of acknowledging the fact that like black communities really don't have um, a space in medicine or Mm -hmm. kind of like people Mm -hmm. who are like really um, acknowledging like their concerns and stuff like that. Like we've seen all like this history of like medical racism and all that stuff kind of ties into um, basically like our distrust of the medical system. There's also like mm-hmm. current instances of that where we think about like going to doctor's office and like having a visit where they might not have explained like a procedure to them well enough, like talk, mm-hmm. tell them like what their treatment actually is and like why that's the treatment plan. Mm-hmm. So basically just mm-hmm. like seeing this like gap and like understanding and like trust within the community and also just like having people who are in their corner and kind of understand, you know, how to talk to them, right? Mm-hmm. So, like just, you know, from my perspective, like as a pre-med student, I've had like friends and family members kind of ask me, you know, like if I have this like bruise or like this like weird like rash appeared, like what should I do? Like they'll ask me like even before they ask their doctors, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm not an actual doctor <laughs> yet, but like I can help you. I can like try and like do some research and like find out like what needs to happen. But like, uh-huh. yeah, just like kind of seeing that like that lack of trust that is there and like how they like mm-hmm. kind of have trust in us and how we can kind of utilize that to, you know, be advocates for our community. So mm-hmm. like I think that's how we got us really got started and um, I joined it kind of just like seeing that mission and thinking about you know how I can be a resource to my community during this time mm-hmm. and also just like thinking about you know how my experience as someone who wants to go into go into the medical field and like address like health policy and kind of those things to go outside of the hospital how that can be strengthened um, by this grassroots organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah we were actually uh, founded by a Harvard med student named Lashira Nolan um, who is literally one of the most incredible people I've ever met. She's just so deeply passionate about going out into the community and doing this type of work. And this story that she always kind of tells um, when she decided that We Got Us was really necessary is when they started like re- unveiling the vaccines. And of course, like the people were saying Black people are skeptical, there's vaccine hesitancy, starting the vaccines. And then some of the topics for how they were trying to fight it was just like showing pictures of black people getting the vaccines, like Tyler Perry and stuff, other black celebrities, mm-hmm. like getting the vaccines, um, which is, you know, not to say that it's not beneficial, but it's just not enough. And she really realized mm-hmm. while these people who are making these decisions don't necessarily have the skill set and the knowledge um, and the involvement in the community to do work that's really going to be impactful for our people and to process information in a way that's going to be accessible to our people. So she mm-hmm. was really passionate about starting We Got Us. So, you know, we got us, we will do this type of work um, mm-hmm. to ensure that our community will be safe. Um, and I joined for a lot of the same reasons as Kareem. I also joined um, late February, early February, uh, mm-hmm. and really just was passionate about that mission, mission that Lash, um, that Lash had, was to save, to help our community um, to stay safe uh, during the pandemic and to give information in a way that's culturally competent um, mm-hmm. and accessible. Mm-hmm. that's great yeah as a side note Lashara and I went to high school together so that's how I found out about We Got Us okay. that's crazy. and she's <laughs> such an amazing person <laughs> anytime I hear of someone like going into the medical field I'm like okay you need to follow Lash on like Twitter <laughs> here's her Instagram mm-hmm. because I think she definitely has done a lot of things just to I guess like spread the word on why there might be medical racism Mm -hmm. Um, the history of it and how it's still happening today and I think it's been like really cool to see someone who is a black person in a medical position 
because growing up that's something that I never saw so Mm -hmm. that's been cool Yeah, so on the note of medical racism, I know that uh, one of the first posts that we got us actually posted on Instagram was like a quote or um, something that said, we recognize our community's hesitancy and distrust of the medical institution as dignified due to the historic and ongoing abuse of our communities at the hands of medical racism. So for our listeners who might be unaware, can you kind of talk a little bit about that history and the unjust medical treatment in the Black community and how we still see examples of this even today? Absolutely. Um, So I think when we hear medical racism as a term, we kind of think of of the most famous example of medical racism, which was the syphilis um, experiment in Mm -hmm. Tuskegee, Alabama, um, Mm -hmm. which is just for a little bit of background. It was this group of men who had syphilis um, and it was a group of white doctors that were trying to study the progression of syphilis um, in the human brain um, and and some of the symptoms that comes with syphilis. Uh, And during the course of the study, there became an available treatment for syphilis, but it wasn't given to these men because they wanted to see Mm -hmm. what late stage syphilis looked like. So they allowed the suffering of these black people to continue in order to get kind of scientific literature um, and a deeper study understanding of the disease. Um, And that's kind of the most famous example, but the the history of medical racism in this country is a lot more nuanced and underreported than we would even think. Of course, it starts with Mm -hmm. slavery um, and that's the the original sin of our nation. Um, And and during that process, that dehumanization of Black people to be seen as slaves was consistently um, taken on and perpetuated by the medical institution. There's things like scientific Mm -hmm. racism where doctors would look kind of like the size of people, Black people's heads. They would look at their skull shape and say they were like comparable to monkeys and stuff like that and were lesser Mm -hmm. human um, than non-Black people. Um, There were also so cases where they would do like studies like on black people without anesthesia in order to perfect surgical technique um, and would later then do those types of surgeries on white patients with anesthesia. Uh, so black people were many times made to be some sort of some type of guinea pig um, for the progression of medicine. And a lot of major medical practices that we see today, like the father of gynecology, things like that, perpetual or started uh, their their treatments and started their surgical techniques on black people. Um, and even today. Uh, some of the most nuanced um, and insidious aspects of medical racism racism is just the way in which Black people have to interact with medicine. You know, there's not mm-hmm. these levels, these practitioners aren't in Black communities. When Black people go um, to get uh, treatment, they're treated uh, like they're crazy. They're treated like mm-hmm. they don't really know what they're talking about, um, things like that. So there's just a lot of insidious examples of the ways in which Black people haven't been treated equitably within the medical institution. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And just like expanding on that, we've seen how like these different treatments like black people within the medical field have like kind of produced these stereotypes, right? Thinking about Mm -hmm. how Marion Sims left like the father of modern gynecology did these experiments on like um, black women um, without like anesthesia. And basically like that kind of led to this uh, view that black people were less susceptible to pain. And like, you kind of see like the the remnants of that today when thinking about like, um, for example, like prescribing pain medicine or like listening to pain of black women um, when they're like giving birth, like during pregnancy, and how this like this disproportionate rate of like maternal mortality. So all these things kind of like are linked together. And then we also just see like with navigating the healthcare space, like kind of what Caleb was saying, how like doctors might not listen to like black people's like concerns or just like not explain to them like how they're really supposed to be like going about getting treatment, and, like what it all means. And then also just like being, um, basically not having the resources to kind of like get medical care in the first place, thinking about how like black and um, Latinx people are less likely to like have to be medically insured, like what that means for them actually seeking care. Mm -hmm. And like you've seen like with the COVID-19 pandemic too, like with emergency rooms, like that's like one of the main places people have to go like when they seek care and they don't, and they aren't Mm -hmm. medically insured. And like, they've been like taken up by like COVID-19 patients. So it's like, where do these people who seek routine care now? And like, there really hasn't been that big of a conversation about it because, you know, the medical system doesn't care or like, they're just not like listening to the, listening to these concerns for the people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think like something that I think is really great about We Got Us is that, you know, you are trying to address these issues and to like help people become more aware of the medical racism and how it is, how we do see it today. It's not something just in the past, like it is ongoing and a lot of people in the black community do suffer from um, medical racism and it's not something that people should just ignore. And I think it's um, really great that I think We Got Us is not only um, bringing this into light and like sharing this information, but also um, one of your things is to kind of dismantle these systems of oppression in our healthcare system. So I guess like what are some specific things that We Got Us is doing and um, 
to address these um, to address um, medical racism that we see today. Yeah, I guess one of our biggest initiatives is providing information to people that's like readily accessible to them and like digestible. Thinking about how like there's this gap in information as far as like what um, medical conditions they might might be um, involving them or like kind of just like how they're supposed to be the ones that, you know, go about treating it or like getting treatment from the mm -hmm. doctor. Um, a lot of what we've seen like the COVID-19 pandemic in general is that like people don't really have this information about like what COVID-19 is, like how it mm -hmm. spreads, um, mm -hmm. kind of like what the vaccines are, how they work. And all that kind of plays mm -hmm. into their decisions to either get the vaccine or not get it, or just like um, observe like the social distancing rules and like other rules that are meant to keep them safe. So, you know, kind of just having the information like present for them to kind of understand, you know, what's going on and allow it to be like digestible and able to like be used readily by the community has been like a big part of like kind of dismantling that medical racism aspect and increasing access to information. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we've seen too, like with dismantling this is like people aren't really being visited in these communities. So like as the community engagement director, I've been like um, planning like in-person cam canvassing events to kind of like go out to the community, like provide resources, thinking about things like PPE, information about COVID-19, and also just like many people's like vaccine registration sites and um, COVID-19 testing sites. Because even with that, you know, there's like, and there's like an inaccessibility there too, because like COVID-19 testing isn't free everywhere. And you know, mm. people like in working class families, they really like need this, but there's no COVID-19 testing in their communities. What can they do, right? Mm -hmm. So like, it's just like trying to basically combat transmission and also just increase information so that people can stay safe during this time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I know that was something you mentioned earlier, Caleb, is like using your privilege of having the vaccine to actually go door to door or meet people in person, because that's something that I thought was like super negative about how the vaccine information was given out from at least what I saw. Like there was no mail about it it was all online and it's like even if you don't have access to the internet or like go online regularly how are you supposed to know how to sign up or when it's available to you like I just think about the people that are older like senior citizens and if they don't know how to use the internet like how how are they going to know about the vaccine mm -hmm. And I mean, if we look at who doesn't have access to the internet, who doesn't have that internet mm -hmm. literacy to be able to go and find this information and then digest it, it's largely black and brown people. It's disproportionately mm -hmm. black and brown people. Um, so that mm -hmm. is another frontier in which medical racism expresses itself. The fact that outreach hasn't been done in ways that are accessible to black people. You know, we, uh, black people are largely community dependent. We, we form these important communities. We gain information through our communities. So I think it's important to speak to those communities in order to express things, not necessarily a social media post and Instagram post. Um, it's better mm -hmm. to go door to door um, in many cases. Yeah, then like we've also seen like with um, kind of like the vaccine rollout in general and just like allowing people who have access to the vaccine to actually go get it. Um, these clinics aren't open all day. So like people who have like regular nine to fives mm -hmm. can't really go mm -hmm. to the clinics and like stand in that line. And like thinking about like the actual like tech insecurity with this, like the vaccine websites haven't been as accessible to people even like <laughs> if they were able to like, you know, get on them. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. They crash, they have like um, outdated information. It's really hard to get an appointment. I remember I was talking to like a professor that's like at Harvard in like a relatively like privileged like position, but it took her like six to seven hours to like actually get an appointment. Oh and even wow. then, like it when she got the appointment, it was like an outdated one. So she really no. didn't. No. Oh wow. Know. That's so bad. So yeah, I like fully. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say I, I heard the story of this guy who had to like write code to like automatically like keep checking the website <laughs> and then yeah. self an appointment. Like, how can the regular person can do things like that? So that's just yeah. a way where it's been accessible. Yeah. yeah, and I have a friend in New York who like tried to sign up to register and the link was redirecting him to an incorrect link and like no one fixed it. So he like had to oh. go <laughs> through something else to like find that link. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Kimmy and um, Annalise have been hearing my struggles for the last two weeks. I've been trying to get an appointment and I would say like I'm 24, so I know how to use a computer and how to navigate a website, <laughs> but like it was so difficult to, it took me like two or three weeks just to even know what site to go on and like mm -hmm. which to, like steps to take. So I definitely firsthand like experienced how like inaccessible a lot of the resources are for people. So mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it'd be like for so many other communities who don't have the privilege that I do. 
Yeah. And I think like I, I took a class once about like health and psychology and they were saying how some sites intentionally, I would like to believe that this isn't true in this case, but some te- sites intentionally like make it really complicated and have a lot of steps so that halfway through people are no longer motivated and they just give up. So if you think about mm-hmm. like, you know, who, who has the patience, first of all, who has the time and who has like the knowledge to follow each step and to understand all this complicated jargon, it's, it's also a sign of like, you know, who, um, who has access and also how it affects, you know, certain communities. Mm-hmm. Um, so from your uh, website and resources that you provided, you kind of talk about your three pillars of empowerment through education, conveying, not convincing, and harm reduction through uh, public health. And so can you just like dive into those more and how you decided on these pillars and how does you, how do you think your organization represents them? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can go first. Um, so I would say, so our first pillar, empowerment through education, that's really about like that information aspect, as information access piece we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Thinking about how do we make this information accessible to people and digestible? Because like we've seen mm-hmm. like this um, this birth of like misinformation around COVID nineteen, especially like our most recent um, well, our past um, presidential elect. So <laughs> like with that, like people were really just like kind of turned off about the idea of COVID nineteen and like mm-hmm. kind of like accessing the vaccine just like from that. And then we've just also seen like people don't really have um, enough background to kind of understand like what's going on. You know, we see like these Twitter and like Instagram posts of like the COVID-19 vaccine, like turns into like a monster or something like that. So <laughs> like, if you don't really have access to like the actual information, like the people kind of believe that. Mm-hmm. Or, and if they don't, it still like inspires fear. So by like, when we say like empowerment through education, we mean like really giving them the tools to kind of understand what's going on, like make the best decisions for themselves. Mm-hmm. And then... I guess our second pillar, conveying, not convincing. That's really just about, you know, making sure everything's like on the table for people. Like there's nothing to really not know. So that really decision like comes down to like what they want to do for themselves and then for the communities. Um, yeah. And it's not like that same like fear, I guess, like or lack of information there. Mm-hmm. And with harm reduction through public health, a lot of that is, you know, even if you get the COVID-19 vaccine, we still don't know like what happens with transmission. So mm-hmm. kind of just like letting people know, like even if you get the vaccine, like you still have to like take the measures to like, keep yourself and your community safe, you know, washing your mm-hmm. hands, wearing a mask, staying six feet mm-hmm. apart. Mm-hmm. All that stuff is really gonna play into like getting over the um, pandemic and kind of just like returning to normalcy um, within the US and like the world in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think all of our pillars are kind of underscored by this understanding of history. I mean, this deep understanding of the medical history that underscores how we experience medicine, how Black people experience medicine and people of color experience medicine. Um, so all of our bullet points are on mitigating that history. And then also, especially our second point, convey not convince, since we recognize that because of that history, because of the inaccessibility of the vaccine, because of the history of medical racism, because of the valid fear that many Black people have of physicians, of hospitals, of doctors, many people will choose not to get the vaccine and it's not even though we at we got us of course believe in the power of the vaccine the safety of the vaccine i'm vaccinated all of those things we can understand why someone may not want to get the vaccine and may have fear they want to wait and see what happens with the vaccine mm-hmm. um and, and you know so much of the discourse around people not wanting to get the vaccine is like do that that's so ridiculous like are they not thinking and it's not the case it's not that they're mm-hmm. thinking it's just that they're thinking of their own history they're thinking of their family's mm-hmm. history and that relationship to the medicine um into the medical field um mm-hmm. and then our last piece especially is we want to recognize for those people who choose not to get the vaccine we're not going to shame them or anything but we want to make sure that they can stay as safe as possible so we do things like give out ppe and how to stay safe mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah you touch on something really interesting because i feel like um especially in like the communities i've been engaging with uh the vaccine is such a choosing to get the vaccine or not is like such a political statement and kind of mm-hmm. tied to a lot of what people would think your political beliefs are and so I think that's really interesting because I never really thought of different reasons um, and communities of why they would choose not to so I really opened my eyes to kind of different nuances to why people would approach the vaccine in a way that isn't so black and white that I previously thought it would I also see too like with like approaching the vaccine and like getting it like there's some privilege that kind of exists mm-hmm. there as well mm-hmm. thinking about like there might be side effects to the vaccine and like people who are afraid like yeah. of having to take off work or like not mm-hmm. having the ability to do that 
it's kind of just like how do we make it even for people who want to get the vaccine more accessible for them to actually like feel comfortable getting it right mm-hmm. yeah in an ideal world I feel like the information about the vaccine could have been handled a lot better and then on top of it like wouldn't it be awesome if the government would give you like a stipend after you got it to say here's the work that you're going to miss the next day because you'll probably have side effects so Mm -hmm. there's so many more things the government could have done um and it's unfortunate that groups like yours have to kind of come together to create this information um and allow it to be more accessible but at the same time it's really awesome that your organization is accomplishing that Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've touched a lot about um, the different aspects of We Got Us and something that we were reading about on the website is that you do host empowerment sessions. So we were just curious to learn more about that. Like, what are those? And if any of our listeners are interested in hosting them, what would that process look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So our empowerment session is led by our incredible um, Director of Education, Ifosi Noma, who is a senior at Northeastern um, and... What our empowerment session really is, is an opportunity to learn more about the vaccine, um, to a deeper understanding of vaccine hesitancy and a space to ask questions. Um, So it really is kind of divided into three parts. The first is we give an overview of medical racism um, and an overview of why um, it seems like there is black people are hesitant or people of color are hesitant to get the vaccine and also some of the institutional reasons for why black people don't have the same access to the vaccine, like where vaccine mm-hmm. centers are, things like black people don't have the same type of jobs, things like that, like, like we've talked about. Um, and that middle piece is really the most important piece is we, we talk about the safety of the vaccine. Um, so we talk really fundamentally about like breaking down what's in the vaccine, what is an mRNA, how is this different mm-hmm. than what, um, what typical vaccines are like. Um, and then we go into the biology um, of the vaccine of COVID a little bit. Um, and then we end um, with discussion on what some could be some possible side effects. Um, and then our last portion is it's really important. We debunk some popular conspiracy theories about the vaccine. Like, no, it does not change your DNA. Um, no, it was not, um, it doesn't have microchips in it. Things like that, that we, so, that sometimes people say, you know, it's like, oh, these are, are ridiculous, but it's really valid um, fears that people have mm-hmm. and that people believe relating to these vaccines that they're not mm-hmm. safe. So that's an important mm-hmm. part. We discuss it with empathy, with nuance, um, why these things, no, they're not true. We understand why you believe them, but they are not true. Um, and then we also give people a space to ask questions, um, which is a really valuable um, part of the of the top of the conversation. They can come and be like, how um, much would we miss off work? Um, talk about their own personal experience, things like that. Um, really ask any type of questions that they could have about the COVID or vaccine. Um, and if you're interested in, in booking an empowerment session uh, for you or um, anyone in your community, um, typically we partner with community organizations like we've done them at schools. Um, we've done them with um, different community activists and their communities. Um, Churches. You can go on our web churches. That's also a group mm-hmm. that we do it with. Those type of community institutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can go on our website, wegotusproject.org. I mean, there is a tab of to book an empowerment session, and we will work with you to to schedule a time that works. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And I also just add on to that and say that it's really about meeting people where they are. So like mm-hmm. we have like pre and post surveys to kind of just like gauge like what people's questions actually are before the empowerment mm-hmm. sessions. And we really tailor them to like what people's needs are, like what they really want to talk about during the discussion. Cause that's mm-hmm. what it is, it's a discussion, but like we're providing information yeah. also just like interfacing with the community. So mm-hmm. it's all about meeting people where they are. That's really great. Speaking of providing people with information, I know that you're also partnered with Boston Public Health Commission and that you visit different COVID-19 testing sites. I think you both of you mentioned this, like going door to door and canvassing and just like um, answering questions and providing more information and resources to people at these sites. So what has that been like to do it in person and how has been, how has the response been from the community? Yeah, so I will say um, on our canvassing trips, basically we organize them based on like populations of like where black people are and kind of just like talking to community partners about like where the, um, the most need lies. So um, in the past, we've gone to Roxbury and that's kind of just like when we're our main area for now. And we plan to expand to like Mattapan and um, Dorchester, like those places that really have like those hard hit like black and Latinx communities. Mm-hmm. And I will say like the reception of it has been, it's been mixed. But we do have, like, what we see is, like, people are generally, like, nice and they want to have conversation with us. Um, some of them might want to get the vaccine, some might not. And really just about kind of, like, figuring out, like, what, um, you know, what people are interested in and kind of just, like, if we can be helpful in any way. It's, so, like, we'll go up to them and say, like, you know, 
Um, we're here to like kind of talk to you about COVID-19, the vaccine. Do you have any questions or concerns? Would you like to register for the vaccine? We can help you do that as well. And like, we've got a few people who we've got some people who actually like wanted to do that. And like, that's been great, you know? And mm -hmm. also just like, if they don't want to, like we provide them with more information to kind of like help themselves or just like giving them, giving them PPE to like stay safe during this time. Mm -hmm. um, and so your point about the Boston Public Health Commission, we actually are in the process of like working out a time to like kind of be in their COVID-19 testing sites. Uh, that's actually like a partnership in process. So Ooh. yeah, we'll probably be setting up a table there. I'm kind of just like being there to kind of talk to people with like general information on COVID-19 and also canvassing like the surrounding area. Cause like um, right now we're um, partnered with like a COVID-19 testing and like vaccination sites. So, like a lot of people were like going in there probably already want to get vaccinated. So mm -hmm. it's about getting that information to people who like don't have it or like haven't decided to like make that step yet. Mm -hmm. I think um, that that was really comprehensive. I just want to um, come off one thing uh, that I think was super interesting. When we're actually out there in the community doing this type of door knocking, it's really those people who don't want to get the vaccine. There's definitely a group of them. It's like, I don't believe it's safe. I don't want it. I don't trust it. But mm -hmm. a lot of those people are like, I'm not going to get the vaccine because I can't because I can't, mm. I've tried to get it. A lot of people have tried yeah. to get it and haven't been able to get an appointment. A lot of people have tried to go on the website, can't figure out the website. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really interesting with the conversation around black hesitancy mm. among the vaccine is not really hesitancy. Mm -hmm. Like actually some studies mm. have shown that it's not black people who are the most hesitant to get the vaccine. It's actually white Republican men who are the most mm. hesitant and distrustful oh. of the vaccine, uh -huh. which is so interesting because we never <laughs> yeah. talk about that. Um, <laughs> and we, we see that, we see that in the community. The, a lot of these people aren't, they don't not want to get the vaccine, they can't get the vaccine, which I think is mm -hmm. so interesting. Mm -hmm. Another thing we've seen too is like, so we're partnering with Get Out the Vaccine. They're basically like a mobile clinic who like goes to underserved communities and provides vaccines to people. Oh. So we've seen like when we like kind of like approach people and say like we have like the vaccine, because like what we'll do is we'll set up in a spot and then we'll like basically like canvas like the building we might be in and say like, okay, like there's a vaccine clinic downstairs. And people are like excited to like come like, you know, get the vaccine. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like there's like this story of like vaccine hesitancy, but like if it's like if you tell people like the vaccine is there, like a lot of them will be very receptive to that. So it's like mm -hmm. it's a matter of access to not just hesitancy absolutely that's amazing yeah so um that sounds really rewarding but um do you have any other rewarding stories or aspects you'd like to share that you've experienced through working with we got us i would say for me um one of the most rewarding pieces have been talking to people like everyone mm -hmm. has like unique mm -hmm. stories that they have to share and you know just like Kind of talking to them about that um thinking about wanting to go into the medical field like being a doctor like one of the things that i really like cared about with is like being able to like share stories with people kind of just like see like where people are coming from and like, what their background is and that's really giving mm -hmm. me the opportunity to do that to these like one-on-one -on -one conversations kind of just like seeing people like where people come from um meeting them where they are and kind of mm -hmm. just, you know being that person who can like have that conversation and like be a resource in their community that's mm -hmm. been really powerful for me for me, I think one thing that's been really powerful is just the relief of people when they're able to actually get the vaccine. Because, you know, of course, we know this pandemic has been so trying and difficult on all of us. But who has been affected most by the pandemic is these people in these black and brown communities mm -hmm. that are really trying to help. You know, they lost their jobs. Their family members have lost jobs. People have lost their lives. Um, and I think this vaccine, you know, it's not, it's not the end, but it's kind of <laughs> a really important and final step towards the end. And I think the relief mm -hmm. that people get when they finally get access to the vaccine and be able to walk with them to the vaccine center and sit with them getting their vaccine um, has been a really powerful thing to watch. That we, this is something we've kind of all went through together. I was kind of reminded, you know, it's wrapping up, it's, it's almost out of time. Mm -hmm. So like there's another resource we have on our website. It's called the Community Collective. So like if there are any like um, people of color, like um, medical professionals that like want to basically get involved in like speaking to their communities about COVID-19 and the vaccine, they can like make a profile on our website and kind of just like be that resource for the people. And we can like basically like set that up for them. Speaking of the end, these segues are really great. Um, <laughs> as like the vaccines continue to roll out in different states, like what is next for We Got Us? Like what is what are future plans that you that this organization has beyond COVID nineteen and the vaccine? Um, as more people become eligible, or more people get the vaccine. Yeah, I will say just from my perspective, um, this organization was kind of founded to like be a space for Black people in medicine and make information more accessible to people. So that does not just end with the COVID-19 pandemic. It also mm -hmm. expands to like other things, like how mm -hmm. Black people are disproportionately affected by diabetes, cancer, mm -hmm. heart disease, like all these different things that are like um, a product of the society we live in and kind of just like these in access, like food, healthy food, you know, public mm -hmm. housing, all of this stuff that kind of compounds it. 
So expanding like um, beyond like COVID-19, we want to like be a space like that to kind of interface with medicine and like un- kind of come to to understand like what's really going on with them and like in their communities. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And even like, I think even, of course that, that is a long-term girl, but I think we think, you know, the, mm-hmm. like, I know I just talked about the, the pandemic being over, but it's not. And there's <laughs> yeah. so, so many people, so many people who don't, haven't gotten the vaccine, even though they are eligible now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think reaching those people is our, our immediate goal, at least for the rest of the year. I think vaccines will be going on at least to the end of the year. And if we look at who is not getting the vaccine, who hasn't had access to the vaccine yet, is exactly the type of people we're trying to help, both here in Boston and in the rest of the country. Because of course, Boston has the most medical institutions, I think in the entire country, I think in the world, probably. Mm-hmm. I don't know that for a fact, mm-hmm. but I know we have <laughs> a ton of hospitals, we have hella hospitals everywhere and a ton of medical providers. Um, but if we think pla- so many places don't, so many places where there's a large concentration of Black people don't have those access, um, to have that access to the medical institutions in the same way Bostonites may have access. So we really want to take some of the lessons we've learned and we got us, some of our literature, our resources, um, and, and take it national and go to other communities um, and help kind of replicate this We Got Us project there to ensure that Black people and Brown people across the country have equitable access to the vaccine. Mm. That's amazing. Just everything your organization is doing is really great. Like I said earlier, I think you guys are really just filling in that gap that the government or other people haven't been able to provide. Um, So that's awesome. And you did mention earlier that both of you were able to get the vaccine being Harvard students, but we would just like to know, like, what was your experience in getting it? Did you have any hesitancies? Um, And then I think Annalise also got it and I did as well so we could just share a little bit about our experiences there yeah I will say with my experience um so like in the beginning of the pandemic there was there was like a a space for me I was like I kind of want to wait and see this was just like toward like December Mm -hmm. like when every well not December I want to say like March of like last year when everything first started but Mm -hmm. then like as I learned more about like COVID-19 and kind of just like who is really affecting it made me realize that like, um, you know, this vaccine is safe and, you know, it's really for our communities because we're the ones who are like disproportionately like dying from it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So when I actually Mm -hmm. did get the vaccine, there wasn't like any real anxiety there. I will say like, after I got it, it was kind of just like getting the flu shot. It was very routine. Um, Like sitting there for that 15 minutes, we're just like, you have to wait and see like if anything like happens, kind of just like, you know, just watching to make sure there's no like anaphylactic like shock or anything like that. Like that, I guess that was like a little bit of an anxiety thing, but I really just kind of sat there and just like waited for the timer to tick. So, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, and like after that, I was just kind of like, you're done. Like, you know, you're vaccinated. You'll be fully vaccinated with COVID-19 in two weeks. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a similar experience. We actually didn't get vaccinated through Harvard. Um, Harvard hasn't okay. uh, because we're not eligible like as our age group, but I got it mm-hmm. um, through a vaccine center. Um, I and I was not hesitant to get a vaccine but actually I was a little hesitant to because I got Johnson and Johnson I felt like Johnson and Johnson had been like mm-hmm. demonized for a minute and yeah. it was like it's not as effective it's not as effective I was a little hesitant to get the Johnson and Johnson one which is the one I did end up getting um and I had called um a doctor in my family and I was like should I still get it like should I wait and get try and get another one a better one um and he was like no you're being ridiculous and it's just most <laughs> important that you get a shot in your arm and I was able um through more engagement we got us to learn you know it's not that Johnson Johnson is less effective it's just um was studied in a different context um it's not really you can't compare the effectiveness numbers um to other people and most importantly you won't get sick and you won't die from the, mm-hmm. the COVID which is the most important thing so that was the only kind of instance of hesitancy that I did have um but was able to, to work through um and in terms of like after the vaccine, I didn't have any symptoms at all. I guess I was kind of oh. blessed. Um, I had a little bit of a sore arm for a little bit, um, but otherwise it was completely fine. Yeah, I um, made a very misinformed statement to Kimmy when I said I didn't <laughs> want them Johnson & Johnson and she very um, <laughs> and aggressively, but um, <laughs> rightfully so, informed me that I was wrong, which is true. I got my um, information from my coworkers who are high schoolers, but oh. <laughs> um, yeah, now I'm like, just I just was begging to get any vaccine. So I think that's funny how that like information was plur- proliferated through the like through social media that like Johnson and Johnson was less effective or yeah. whatnot yeah 
I mean, my, my mom's not a teenager and she said that Johnson and Johnson is a great either. I think there's like, I don't know what it is, but everyone just doesn't like Johnson and Johnson compared to the other two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, and I, I know, right. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. You can go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was going to say, there's also just like a history there with Johnson and Johnson too. Thinking about oh. things like Alcum Powder, um, the Alcum mm-hmm. Powder incident, like other products that have like caused, uh, you know, cancer and people like other adverse things so like there's definitely like some valid concerns there Mm -hmm. that's true I didn't think of that um yeah I was fortunate enough um there was a vaccine center that did have extras so I did get the Johnson and Johnson one and I was not particularly hesitant um my family has basically not done anything since COVID we've been like locked up and my parents and brother have stayed really on top of the news so they're like, okay, here's what's happening. Here's why we need to get it. Um, so that's been very helpful to know. Kimmy, what was your experience with the Johnson Johnson? Oh, I did have uh, side effects the next day, but it was just like getting the flu. It was fine. I recovered quickly. Yeah, for for me, I know, like I mentioned earlier, I was like hesitant to get any vaccine at all. And I was going to kind of wait and see how other people reacted first. But then I was talking to my friend who's in medical school. And then he was like, no, like you should get it if it comes available to you. Like it's it's good. And he like kind of told me why. Um, and so I, I am getting Moderna um, and I just had a sore arm. So which is fine. I can I can deal with a sore arm. <laughs> Yeah, I actually worked for a doctor and this is like when COVID was kind of taking like just starting um, and then she was very set on not getting a vaccine because she was like, um, and that vaccines never work, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's interesting mm-hmm. how like, I don't know how her opinion might have changed since the vaccine actually came out, but like I was at one point um, like I believe or like I agreed with what she was saying, how she explained it to me, like how, um, I don't want to misinform anyone because I not can't remember exactly what she said, but um, how at one point I was also pretty hesitant to get the vaccine, but um, yeah, now I'm lucky to have gotten an appointment and I'm looking forward to helping my community and making sure everyone stays safe. So kind of wrap up this whole episode what is your advice for people who are hesitant in taking the vaccine I guess it's hard because like people have different reasons for why they're hesitant but like (laughs) if you could give just like some some advice um, that could help I guess I would say like if you're hesitant to get the vaccine it's definitely understandable no matter like what Mm -hmm. background you're coming from Mm -hmm. especially like for black and brown communities because like they have like there's like a historical and present um, reason for Mm -hmm. them to be hesitant um but I would just say like make sure that you do your research kind of gather all the information that you need or like seek it seek out help from other people kind of just like make sure that the reason that you're hesitant is um it's a hard question really but I guess like (laughs) really it's just like making sure people like do the research and kind of um make that decision for themselves like the most I guess with all the resources that are available to them I would say that and if that decision means like you don't want to get the vaccine, like that's fine. Like you don't have to get it, but you know, just making sure that you have all the information there before you make that decision is what I would say. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, would one hundred percent agree with that. Um, I would just tell people make sure this is a well-informed decision that you can back mm-hmm. up um, your choice to get it or not to get it with sources and resources, um, whether that's conversations with a doctor, articles and stuff that you've read online. Um, regardless, uh, make sure you're looking up reputable sources, uh, look on large news people, large type um, medical resources online and not necessarily like mm-hmm. some niche blogs, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to your physician if you have one, um, talk to medical friends if you have them. Um, and if not, we got us, can be that medical friend, <laughs> shameless plug. Um, <laughs> and, um, if you decide not to get the vaccine, just stay safe, stay inside, continue to socially distance, continue to wear a mask. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So how can people learn more about We Got Us? And are there opportunities to get involved with your, with your organization or to support your efforts both in Boston and in other cities? 
Mm-hmm. Oh, one thing I, I also wanted to say about the previous yeah. question. Oh, like, yeah. if people are hesitant to get the vaccine, they just want to know inf- more information. Like, definitely visit We Got Us's website and like register mm-hmm. for an empowerment session because we will walk you through the whole process if that's mm-hmm. what you need. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of how to get involved, um, we ha- if you're in the Boston area and comfortable doing um, in person programming, you can reach out to info at wegotusproject.org. Um, and we will follow up with you on some opportunities to get involved in person. Um, if you want to help lead empowerment sessions, um, be on our research team, anything like that, you don't have to be in Boston. Um, and then you can also reach out to that email info at wegotusproject.org. And we will find a place for you to get involved. And you're interested in find, uh, supporting us financially, we have a donation portal on our website. If, and we would love the opportunity for you just to promote us, um, tweet about us, post about us, whatever. Um, we would we would heavily appreciate any type of conversation that could be generated around us, around the work we're doing so that we can reach as many people as possible. Yeah, and also like if you're not in Boston or local, still feel free to reach out to us because like we want to make sure that we're expanding like our resources and information to other parts of the country. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. And we got us, uh, all of their information will be in the show notes as well as on our Instagram. So definitely check them out. Um, I've been paying pretty close attention to their Instagram and it's really great in terms of like the resources that they provide. They definitely do break a bunch of myths about the vaccine. And then they also reshare stories about COVID stats. So it's a really great place to like easily stay informed with what's happening while you're scrolling <laughs> aimlessly through your feed. <laughs> yeah, one of the, I guess, I don't want to say this as passively as it sounds, but the benefits that have come out from the pandemic, I think, is it's really shown the limitations of our healthcare system and kind of um, what it's lacking and um, the improvements need to be made that have been mm-hmm. present for so long. So I think that's great that there are organizations like yours that have come out of this situation so that our healthcare system can grow and we can really amend some of the um, problems that we have even if it's like been present for so long already yeah I would definitely say that's like kind of the light at the end of the tunnel right because as these like as COVID-19 has kind of exposed all these things that have always been wrong with the healthcare system Mm -hmm. it's really hard to look away and I feel like it's an opportunity to kind of transform the healthcare system that we currently have into something that's better for like the future Mm -hmm. of black and minority health like in the medical space Mm-hmm. Absolutely, um, and I think that is a, that's absolutely a long term goal. If we got us, and when we as we envision our organization beyond COVID, um, we have all this um, institutional memory. We have all these examples of what it was like actually being out here fighting COVID, and what are the barriers um, that we we face and that our community faced um, in, in getting that information out um, and getting saved from the pandemic. Um, and we hope to one day transition into the org that can also use that information to help inform health policy, transform health policy mm-hmm. in a way that's race conscious, in a way that's better for Black and Brown communities. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Thank you so much for Caleb and Kareem for joining us. We really enjoyed speaking to you two about We Got Us, as well as you two just going in depth on medical racism that the Black and Brown communities have experienced. So thank you again for coming. Um, and thank you all for listening. You can follow us on Instagram at Adulthood Pending Podcast. Join us every other Monday for new episodes. We can't wait to share our stories and we're excited that you're with us on our adulthood journey. Bye. 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 <laughs> <So much. laughs>